Hello and welcome to session 3 of the Acrylic Painting Club Online School. Today we'll be painting a whimsical picture of a little bluebird on a fence which I created in Tennessee and I brought him all the way to Florida to be able to share it with you. My name is Mara Trumbo of Art Expression Studio and I'll be your host today. My acrylic colors of choice are deco art traditions. They are professional grade and wonderful to use. I normally brush mix my colors and not do it on the palette. So as you can see, I have white, lilac and crimson ready for our sky. And here they are on the brush, different quantities. I never ever mix a little puddle, um, as I call it my Betty Crocker uh, experience uh, of all one color, one flavor. Uh, by picking up a little bit here and a little bit there, you do tend to get different shades in the sky. And starting with the two sides of the sky, you would go with the darker colors, gradually picking up more white for the center. You will also note uh, the angle of my brush. They are crisscross strokes done with more pressure on the side of the brush than on the chisel, so you don't spoil your beautiful brushes. And I also tend to paint at an angle. And why I do that is to avoid seeing, um, as I do in many of my student paintings, bands of colors straight across. You can already see some of the formation of the clouds actually just with um, soft white strokes in, in the middle. And if you want to enhance them, of course, you can use the side of the brush as we will in a little while, um, the flat brush and um, a mop brush to soften them. Um, without using a, a fan brush or anything special. Um, the brushes that I'm using are also made by Deco Art. They're fantastic, hard wearing and uh, long, last long, longer than anything I've had in my studio before. And believe you me, I give them a rough treatment, especially when I do clouds and skies. As you can see here, the mop brush comes in handy. Sometimes I leave a silver lining on the clouds, especially if I'm doing large skies and a smaller landscape. But here we don't want to detract from the little bird who's the main character in our story. So I'm going to soften these clouds, but it's up to you. You can leave the silver lining there or fade it out gently. Uh, by doing the circular motion, you are pushing the paint into the layer beneath. So the underneath will um, uh, blend in easily with your sky and you can always reinforce the colors. You will note the two sides of the canvas are darker and I often do that. In fact, in most cases, uh, my friend Bob Ross taught me that years and years ago. It, it shows the infinity of the sky when the corners of your canvas are darker than the center. And of course, as you go down towards the horizon, you'll automatically lighten all your colors. And now I'm switching from lilac to crimson to white. If there is too much um, light in one piece, I will bring in the dark. And as you know, painting is a play of lights against darks and darks against lights. So we we'll work our way down towards um, the center of the canvas. The sky actually takes about 60% of your picture here. So give it some time and take your time. Of course, I've speeded up this film because you'll get thoroughly bored just watching me paint skies and clouds. Um, without washing my brush, I'm actually now introducing the Indian yellow onto my brush with the white and some of the pink will still keep on coming through and I don't want too much of a stark change of color from one to the other. So I will blend in all the colors on the dirty brush. Now, depending on the speed that you go, you can either use some extender or a little bit of water or give yourself a break, have a cup of coffee, wash your brush in between then. Um, let me tell you that I've, I've painted this so fast that um, I didn't wash my brush right until the end. But um, don't do as I say. Um, Take my advice, it's good to wash your brush once in a while because the collection of the paint right up to the ferrule doesn't do it much good. And you don't want to lose your the spring in your bristles. So here I'm reintroducing some of the darker colors because I felt the sky was too light too soon. So I'm putting a bit of lilac and alizarin crimson back with the yellow and the white. 
and then just building it up slowly as I get down. Now although you're only using portion of the sky will be showing through the trees, I have a tendency to want to paint my canvas right to the bottom. And why I do that is because if any small area happens to be left unpainted, like the areas between the branches of your trees where the birds fly, um, you want to see that nice sky behind it. Trying to put it in afterwards always looks plasticky to me, it looks like an applique. Um, I've seen actually famous artists paint the entire tree and then insert the sky behind it and I admire them for it. Uh, I've tried and to me it just looks artificial and I prefer to do my sky first and then um, the, which is in the background and then the middle ground and then the foreground on top of it. Also it's a way of using up the leftover paint on your palette before you change your colors and it gives you extra softness underneath. It's like an extra layer of gesso on your canvas. Now here, don't mind going a little bit darker with a golden color because this will actually be your pathway eventually. And it will be earth colors at the bottom um, with your pathway being um, umber and sienna color with a little bit of the grass showing at the bottom. So any dirty color at the bottom will do. Don't forget to paint the bottom of your canvas and the sides if you're having a um, gallery canvas. Now we're going to start having real fun with sponge painting. If you haven't done so before, you'll enjoy it. These are natural sea sponges. They come in little pieces at the art stores in a little bag. But if you only can buy the big one, then tear it up with your hands. Do not cut it with scissors. You want the rough edges. So here is your full sky. And actually, I think it looks nice enough to frame. <laughs> um, I just put a ruler against it to give me an average. Looking at the pattern, I want to start the background trees about four inches up. And the background trees are going to be loaded on this sponge with blue, gray and white. I pounce them on my palette in a little um, session just to get rid of the big lumps if I've picked up any. And also to make sure there's a transition of colors in between. So from four inches upwards, I start dabbing and go softly first. Don't dab too hard, too quickly. You can always go back and reinforce it as we will later, but you want to do a little soft, soft pat pat with your sponge. If you want more of the light, you press on the top. If you need more of the dark, you press at the bottom and the color in between will be in the middle. So little pat. Uh, taller trees, different uh, sizes, different heights is good. And these will basically be all the same uh, neutral color, which in the background, as you know, you don't see the foliage of trees with greens. But as you come closer, and this is starting to be the middle ground, I've introduced some of the green with the blue mixture, blue gray mixture. Again, without cleaning the sponge, it's being added on. Now what you want to do is start turning your sponge around to create different, you don't want just points there, you actually want uh, around the edges. So you can either do that by turning the sponge around or using another piece of the sponge which will give you a different formation. I love sponge painting. It looks so natural that you can almost touch the, the thicknesses. Now here I did wash the sponge and I'm using another one which is thicker and rounder and it's got uh, dark green, light green and yellow on it. So both sides are going to be slightly different. On the left I've actually picked up even a little bit of orange and I'm sorry it's off camera. We're now going to define them with the trunks and the branches. So starting on the side where I've added a little bit more autumn colors, you see a little bit of brown sienna there and orange and yellow in that uh, bush. And um, you want to start highlighting the edges that are a little bit lighter. So here and there you want to start defining. Now this can also be done at the end, but it's better if you do it progressively so it gives you an idea, feel of the sponge and you only mess your hands once. <laughs> Now we take a round or a liner brush, whichever you feel comfortable with, and you make an inky uh, dark umber mix with water. And load up your brush good, and starting from the bottom, work up. Don't forget the trunks are always thicker at the bottom, thinner as you go up. 
and I've only ever seen one artist start from outside in and that's Bob Ross. He, he could master his brush. I prefer to start from the bottom up. Releasing the pressure automatically gives you a thinner ending. Here I'm trying to do Bob Ross starting from outside in but I'm not so successful. As you see the end of the branch is a little blunt so I'll be covering it up later on. Now alter the colors that you use, like the foreground uh, bush here is dark brown, the middle ground will be a lighter shade, so I've mixed a bit of gray with it, and of course the trees at the end will just be a, a grayish color, nothing too definite there. Now we're going to add more foliage across some of the branches. To make them look three-dimensional, you don't want to see the full skeleton of the tree, so you want to cover it because there's leaves growing in front of it as well. So I've picked up similar shades but a little bit lighter here, and I'm going to come across them. So that gives you a three-dimensional bush. Now you want to do this here and there, you don't want to cover everything you've just painted. And remember, be light on the sponge, and if uh, you're nervous about how much paint you've picked up, always dab some of it on your paper towel or your palette before you actually go onto your canvas. The Tuscan pines at the back uh, were looking a little bit thin, so I'm going to reinforce them, and instead of using the sponge again, I'm showing you an alternative. I have um, a little round brush here, which I've loaded up with the same colors which were still fresh on my palette because I sprayed them with water. I spritz them to keep them open, more open time. So just dab, dab, dab here and there to thicken them up a little bit, brighten up some of the tips against the sky. And I'm possibly overdoing it here, but just to show you. <laughs> I often do that, sometimes I keep on preaching less is more, but sometimes I overdo it too, yes sir. <laughs> so blue at the bottom, transitioning with the grey in the middle. And overlap them so the colours blend, and then going up with the white. And this little bit is a little repetitious, I uh, just wanted to stress out that um, it is a corrective procedure right through. Uh, if you make mistakes, these uh, acrylics are very thick, very powerful pigment, so you can correct any time along the way. Just try not to mess up the sky because we blended it so much that it will be very hard to try and match exactly the same shade. You'll just have to grow another tree there. With your liner brush, bring in some of the tree trunks. And again, do them in uh, small little jerky movements. You don't want a solid white line down the middle because some of the branches will have leaves in front. And then there'll be some uh, very, very background trees that you're only going to see a faint line in the background. So just if they're too strong, cover them up with a little bit more white. And then there'll be some twigs and um, sticks in the front. So just add a little bit here and there but don't overdo it. With your dirty brush, just complete the cover at the bottom, just whatever colors you've been using there, just smudge them into the bottom, and we're going to create a muddy background. Darker under the trees and lighter as you come forward, and then of course we'll start adding some greens onto it as well. push up in some cases so it looks like little bushes yeah. 
Now, if you hold your thick brush sideways after you've um, uh, picked up all your dirty colors, we're actually going to put some of the dirt in the ground there. So just hold it sideways, uh, almost like we did the clouds, okay? You're just uh, shoveling dirt, as it were, into the foreground now. And if it streaks and you're seeing some of the background, leave it there because it looks like a reflection of the sky coming through. This is a very impressionistic painting. There's no rights and there's no wrongs. If you want to change any of the colors along the way or um, do your garden landscaping different, please feel free to do so. The pathway um, is actually done with umber and sienna. I seem to have picked up a bit of everything over here, um, but I'll correct it later on. So. It's really just to outline it and then I'm going to fill in the dirt again on the pathway. I'm adding some of the orange and the Indian yellow in here. As you can see on the brush. A brush mix again. And that's because I couldn't find my sienna bottle I had hidden behind the corner. So I tried to make it up with various colors. And I actually encourage you to do that if you don't have every color of the spectrum, um, learn to blend and mix your own. I think I went a little bit too light in here and I'll correct that as I go along as well. I picked up some white by mistake. But I have fun trying to do corrections as well. Redefine the edges where I've smudged them. And then just fill in the bottom <clears throat> where the grass will actually be. The picket fence will be standing in front of this. So you don't have to be too fussy about everything being perfect because so much of it will be covered over. And here again, um, painting the bottom and painting the sides with the corresponding colors that you have so that when you hang it up it looks um, neat even before you frame it. We're now going back to the sponge painting and I hope you remember to soak your sponges while we were brush stroking. We're now going to do the tree on the right hand side and here I must remind you although this is a big tree do not overfill the space. You want to leave some of the sky showing through. After all, that little bird needs to find a place to nest and to fly through. Because I'm actually painting on the wrong side so my hand wouldn't cover the canvas, I pressed a little bit too hard. So I'm now having to go over some of those um, solid parts and uh, touch them up but this is a good way to for you to see how to correct mistakes the bottom of the sponge has got dark green uh, a middle green is on the uh, center part and um, a light green or yellow and white sometimes I alternate is on the edge and here I'm just putting little flecks of light again here and there twisting my hand as I go so that it doesn't look like rubber stamping all the same. And this is possibly where I realized I had too light. So we now need some dark, especially underneath where the foliage is thicker. So I'm going to start adding some of the dark by pressing um, stronger at the bottom of the sponge. And yes, you can do overdo it with the dark as well, so you just go back and fix it up. Dab, 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 dab. How easy is that? You've created a whole tree in a few minutes. Now 
now we're going to put in the trunk and I'm using the round brush which is obviously thicker than the liner brush and taking it up and skirting a few areas in between now don't forget the parts that are solid will have leaves painted over again and always remember the trunk is much thicker than the branches if you ever get a branch that it becomes too thick um, and you can't remove the paint quick enough then my suggestion is that you just widen the trunk to match So you can do the trunk with a round <clears throat> brush and then if you like later on change to the liner brush if you feel more comfortable to do the smaller branches in between and coming out at the end. What you're seeing at the side is the sheet of my pattern which I only put in there to help me not to go over that space with the tree fronds else I'll be infringing onto the fence and the little bird. You don't want it too close. I'm now putting a little bit of light on the dark on the left side where the sun is shining through and this can be either done with the beige mixed with sienna or um, just beige on its own. So streak the tree here and there and make it look like it's um, textured. Now the tree on the other side, on the left side, with the one that's got a little bit more um, branches, thicker branches, you definitely don't want to leave it that way. It requires additional foliage to go on top as well, so those branches sort of disappear in between. So again with a sponge loaded up with the similar colors you had and a few lighter ones on the ends, which will be your highlights. You'll sponge here and there to cover some of the ends and to actually also make a few fronds falling over into the sky very softly. And that's what it should look like and it gives you a three-dimensional look. The same dabbing technique is done to the middle ground branches with a lighter color and the background um, as well so this is what it'll look like <clears throat> your finished piece we're getting through to the um, end of part one let this dry before you transfer your pattern wash your brushes wash your sponges and we'll see you back in a little while enjoy your coffee time Hello, welcome back. I hope you've replenished your energy because we're going to be busy, busy, busy painting a little bluebird and the flowers on the picket fence. So switch your lights on, load your brushes, let's get the camera rolling and here we go. This is what our finished piece will look like. I am Mara Trumbo, your instructor for this um, session. And I so enjoyed putting this together. I have also kept some of the photographs that I use in my reference library um, with the kind permission of birds and blooms I have got a little bluebird you can be as um, thorough as you like with the details or more whimsical like I've got lavender sprigs are also from them as well as the golden shower the trumpet flower that I have idealized on this painting and simplified it somewhat so now that we've got the background we put the canvas on one inch from the bottom and right onto the left side clip it in place and with your graphite um, trace a dark painting as you can see we only have a tracing for the picket fence and the bird everything else has been done freehand so i have speeded up the film and the first thing you'll be doing is um, coating the picket fence with the dark blue it actually looks um, it's, it's black but it looks blue on the on the film but you can use either if you're going for a gray color fence you might want to do the black or blue background if you're going for a more natural wood look you might want to this do this section in umber and the top in beige 
So we will do the first coating in the paint and um, it's the three picket fence and the crossbars. Now you're going to tell me why on earth did we paint all that beautiful background if half of it is going to be covered over. Well, it's just that if you try and do the background afterwards and squeeze it in between the bars, it's never the same. It'll look added on. So unfortunately, you may be rubbing out uh, some of your <laughs> better looking trees, but um, this is a gamble we take. So this is just a quick going over with the dark paint. We then use crackle medium and um, use it fairly thick. This is made by Americana Decor and it'll go over once the base color has thoroughly dried. Okay, go in one direction only. I have used this on the easel simply because I was filming, but I suggest you use your canvas flat on the table so that it stops dripping and running down your arm like it's doing to me right now. Try and do this all only in one direction. Um, well, of course, it depends on you. Some crackle will act uh, react uh, differently when it's um, done uh, horizontally instead of vertically. Now here I had forgotten to put in my little black piece. So I'm adding it on and then putting the crackling on. Once the crackling is thoroughly dry, you will go over it with a thin layer of your chosen color, either light gray or light beige. Don't overstroke, go down only once. If you have to remove the extra paint, just very lightly um, go on top, very, very lightly. Don't press because otherwise you start breaking up the formula. Just a little dab here and there will do. Now this crackling came out very fine because obviously I hadn't used enough and I'm always afraid of overdoing it. So I will be enhancing it later on and you'll see how. The parts where the sun shines are added into the gray. I've added a little bit of white, so you've got a highlight sitting on top of the crossbars and also on the right side of um, each of the picket fence. So come down um, and be as tidy as you can. I, I was in a rush, of course, because of doing the film and I was late with the project, I'm sorry to say. And so I haven't been as detailed as I would normally do. Also because I was thinking there'll be flowers climbing up there and they'll hide a multitude of sins. But it's now to enhance the um, wood grain and the sides um, and all the shadows, I have used a ruler and sharpies and you're welcome to do that. Time to paint Mr. Bluebird now, our main character in the story. And we already have the tracing. I'm going to close up on that. And we always start with black with the eyes, um, which are the windows of the soul. So we're going to be using black for the eye, for the beak, and uh, for his legs and his claws. The beak will be highlighted later on. And um, so we're using a small little liner brush or if you have a smaller round brush. Each of the feet has got three little claws there. We can strengthen the legs if they come out too thin. And the highlight in his eye will be added later on once the black is totally dry. Then we're going to um, put a line on his beak which divides the top and the bottom. But because the top is uh, in, in the sun, it'll have a reflection and we're going to use the dark blue for that. Then we're going to have the dark blue um, as a base color on his head. And sometimes it's good to hold two brushes with both colors so you don't have to keep on wiping or cleaning and washing and changing colors. Then with the lighter blue we're going to do tiny little dot dot strokes. You can't really see feathers on his head, they're so tiny, but if you just wiggle your hand and just show some movement, that'll give the impression of soft little dawn feathers on his head. Going down the back, we're going again into the darker blue. And then the wing um, to will be highlighted, so we use the lighter blue to start with. 
and I speeded up this film as you can see because the strokes are pretty similar throughout his body and it'll get monotonous for you to see each each feather being painted these are the back wing feathers and uh, right now I have uh, done them in reverse. Normally I like to start them from outside in and uh, the, the other ones from the body out. But I knew I was going to cover it with uh, white at the end for the feathers. And that white blends in with the blue. And always start that from the outside in. Again here, little feathers, little feather strokes going towards the wing. I'm putting the dark blue shadow underneath. And then dragging some of the blue up towards the wing. Now my brush has got a mix of both the light and the uh, dark blue. And I quite like it because it forms a third color. And then I pick up the white without wiping my brush. So that it's got a tinge of blue in it as well. You don't want a stark white against that blue. Now this portion in the middle here, I should have actually done it uh, now between the back wing and the front wing. It should be a dark color and you'll see me squeeze it in afterwards and finding it difficult and having to touch up the wings again. So um, when you do yours, put the dark in between straight away. Here we go, now I've got to try and squeeze between the back and the front wings and of course I'm messing up the ones in the front but at least it's a way of showing you how to correct things and that's a blue-black that I've got in there it's a mixture of the blue and the black and so I go over it again with the wings at the end and I'll be highlighting those once again once it's dry The uh, long tail feathers are also blue And only two are visible and the merge into the dark there and the underneath of his body going up towards the tail is also bluish color and while we have the light blue we're just going to go a little bit under his eye and next to his beak and the area around his eyes also a, a light whitish blue and of course I've smudged his eyes so no problem get back to the black put the little black dot again wait until it dries before you put the highlight and make stroke tiny little feather strokes right up to his beak he's also got like a little mask not as pronounced as you would have in a chickadee but um, he does have a darker marking in front and behind his eyes so he looks like a little Zorro at the moment but once you put in the little feathers it'll sort of blend in here we are now this area is going to be uh, a golden color and I've used diluted sienna and then the feather strokes uh, which will go on top of this while it's still wet will be beige and then enhanced with white Again, if you paint slow, um, you're welcome to put a little bit of extender with the sienna. I've um, just put a little bit of water because I wanted it very diluted. Now you can see I've picked up a little bit of the blue, which gives it a little uh, greenish uh, hue. And I quite like that. Sometimes accidents happen for a reason. And you don't want everything just the exact color coming out of a tube, so I blend a lot with a tiny little liner brush and inky white and beige I am doing some of the feather work here and the tiny tiny little strokes actually they're like little comma strokes overlapping but you do want to see some of the base color underneath so as it's um, the colors wearing out and you're getting down towards the darker area that's good because it starts forming the shadows and of course being acrylics we'll go over it once twice three times if we have to I always do final touch-ups at the end and 
I'm sorry I didn't move the camera for this bit, but the <clears throat> bottom of his belly is actually <laughs> the same color as you have under his wings. It's very hard when you're doing your own uh, filming because you're on the other side of the camera not seeing exactly just how much you are accomplishing. And the area between the blue and the tummy is uh, got a, a lighter color so I'm base coating it with white and then I will go back into the blue because you always have to zigzag between one color and the other to form a third shade. So we've got blue and white here and we will have gold and white on the other side. So a little bit of the gold which is really sienna mixed with a beige. Coming down. And here's a little bird. We're now going to do some final touches. A little bit more gold on his tummy before he goes into the shadow there. You can have some of the feathers um, coming out of his body. A little ruffled feather here and there will look cute. And then with Sienna I have put a little bit of shadow under his wing as well. So more little feathers here on the golden part that touches onto the blue. And because the blue on his head is already dried, I'm just picking up some fresh blue there to just merge the two colors in between. So you now got the blue coming into the gold. And down towards um, his chest a little bit. The area around his eyes also a light blue. Oops, smudge there, we'll fix that later. And of course there'll be little highlights. Um, here comes the highlight in his eye, which makes him come pop all of a sudden. He's alive and looking at you. More touch up on the feathers. And then along his back where the sun is shining, we're just going to put a couple of little feathers that are catching sunlight. Put a shadow in between the two tail feathers and the one underneath. And highlight the end of the tail feathers, a bit of white and blue going up, just drag it up gently, that's it, till it disappears. I used to be terrified of painting acrylics, I thought you could only shade and highlight <laughs> with oils. I was absolutely terrified and I'm so loving it now. I could sit and paint all day. Because traditions have spoiled me because it's so thick and full of pigment. Okay, now we need some grass in front of the picket fence and just slightly behind it. We're going to do that with the same background brush that you used, double loaded with dark green and light green. And it's no major thing, you just whisk some of the grasses up. And then just come across, remember not to push your brush on the chisel but on its side so you don't damage it. And it's just little strokes left and right. And the sides and bottom of the canvas need to be painted as well. Don't forget you want a professional look when it uh, sits on your wall. It's painted all the way around with the picture continuing on the other side. This is just an impressionistic little bush of leaves of some kind or other just to end up that little patch and now we're going to go on to the lavender bush. I love these little lavenders. I think it was the first flower I learned when I started uh, doing um, one stroke painting and uh, the stroke was initiated by Donna Dubry 
uh, one of my first teachers in decorative painting. So we put in the stalks first, we double out the brush with uh, purple and uh, sky blue. And we start center left and right, center left and right, and you work your way down. And you don't want just left and right because otherwise it'll look like a fern with two sides. You actually want it to look round, three-dimensional. So there's always got to be a middle petal as well. I speeded up the movie here again um, because there's going to be four, five little sprigs of lavender and the, it gets pretty boring if you have to look at them for this long. So I'm just speeding it up, but it's much of the same blue and purple and then you can highlight here and there with white. Now lavenders have long blade leaves and again this is done a one stroke style um, with a double loaded uh, liner brush or you can use your round brush and I love loading dark green, light green and yellow and uh, where the sun hits it you'll see some of the sunlight reflecting there into the long blades so the stroke is push slide and taper off and you can do some curve don't do everything totally straight it looks too spiky so always give them some gentle curving that's about enough leaves now we can put in a few grasses but before we do that let's go over to the trumpet flowers on the right side of the lavender we have trumpet flowers and these are like a golden shower bloom and we start again with the vines going around the picket fence done in just plain green with your liner brush and an inky color so bring it round over the other side and up add a couple of shoots and then some little uh, stems for your leaves to start with. You can either um, group your little leaves, and I always do in about threes or fives. And these are one stroke leaves, double loaded brush again with dark and light um, green. You press and pull, press and pull, and always have the dark side attached to the stem, okay, and the light facing um, towards the light. So you have the sky above, the light is shining above, so you'll notice the light green is all facing that way and the dark is facing underneath. It's been like 15 years since I learned one stroke, but I still love painting these little leaves. I do it when I paint in oils as well. And sometimes, you know, it's good to cross hatch all the techniques you've learned with different teachers and form your own style. This painting, as I said, is whimsical. It's um, a cross between decorative painting and fine art, I guess. Now to do the flowers, we are doing like a V-shaped or U-shaped with the dark facing underneath and the light on top. You slide down and slide up. Put a little dot in the center so you can go around it. And these are like teardrop strokes across and out the other side and you're basically going around that little dot that was in the middle which is the center of the throat of the flower in which we'll put pollen later on so this one is done with the dark facing out some of them I will do with the light facing out just to be different so here again slide down and slide back up fill the center in this one is light on the outside Little buds are nothing but little one teardrop stroke, or two, or three, depending if the flower is opening up, or if it's still not mature enough to open. Put as many or as few as you like. I always encourage my students to use their own freedom of expression. Um, to add, subtract, change colors, and make that picture your very own. I'm darkening the throat there of that one. 
and that one which is facing three quarters of the way around enhancing the outline with a little bit of white and now putting in the pollen just dot 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 in the center and here's another bud about to open a few little ones there and put the calyx around them and join them onto the main branch don't leave them just hanging <laughs> I often do that, I have to check, retract all my steps and make sure they are hanging on to the vine or they're going to die. Put a little smiley face on there to show the throat going in. And you can enhance some of the light um, coming out towards the stems. Now the smaller leaves can be done with your round brush, again double loaded press and pull, press and pull, press and pull, join them up to the stem, press and pull. And these are obviously more um, towards the end of your vine because they're young, they haven't fully matured. So you put them next to your little buds, make them smaller according to the size of the buds too, and then press them a little bit uh, bigger elsewhere. Now the lattice fence, I haven't done a pattern for this simply because it's such a, a simple rectangle and um, I have even changed the color. I've done gray from um, left to right and then white from right to left and I don't know why I bothered because by the time you put up the hollyhocks most of it will be covered but whatever shows at least will look like a lattice now we're going across with the white there and again you don't have to be all that precise and you'll see why in a little while now that is highly visible so that will want it straightened out afterwards and um, shadows underneath as well the hollyhocks again are done with um, the stems first, mainly as guidelines because half the stems will not show. And then we will go around a center point with the colors of your choice. Yellow of course is a very transparent color, I'll probably have to go over this a couple of times to uh, enhance it a little. And then I'm going with red and white. Some hollyhocks grow in little clusters, so you have two or three um, growing around the same stem before they move up. And of course they get smaller as you go up, and right on top you'll have the closed ones which are just little green dots. I'm double loading the brush in every instance, so you've had yellow and white, uh, red and white, blue and white, and now we've got orange and yellow, just for a change, and then burgundy with... Um, Alizarin Crimson, I should say, with red, which gives a beautiful, solid color. Very strong. I love that actually for my roses as well. And here I'm going with Alizarin, um, excuse me, with Darks in purple and white. And then strengthening the blue, which is looking a bit wishy-washy. Strengthening the yellow and white again. And now we're going to put in some leaves. Now leaves are done round like lily pond leaves, but because you've seen them from a distance and because you're so far away, all you're doing is just an impression of the leaf. So it's an elliptical uh, oval shape here and there, and then just touch, touch, touch on the way up. And you're really just fooling the eye into believing that those are leaves and flowers. And the last one, we're just going to leave some greenery climbing up there. And then with the dirty brush, um, be planting the lawn. <laughs> White and green and a little bit of blue and a little bit of dirt. Some alizarin crimsons on the brush as well. I love playing with colors when I play, when I do ground, um, ground cover. <laughs> yeah, th this is a ground cover, I guess. 
Now strengthen some of the colors if you're not happy with what you've done and then we'll proceed. There's some little flowers in front of the trellis and they're really just ground cover. So again, blah, blah, blah with a flat brush. You can also use your round brush and that's a dirty green with a little bit of purple in it. And then on the tip of the brush, I have got um, blue and white blue and white and I'm just doing some little abstract flowers there I don't even know what they are maybe a little grouping of daisies so you can get your little round brush later and make some um, more distinct flowers add a few grasses along the fence and for good measure we'll put some little flowers here as well now since we had blue on the other side, well, we'll put some blue in here and some green leaves, but then we'll add a, a little bit of yellow, I think. Yellow would look nice as a contrast here. So tiny little dot dot flowers here and there. There could be pansies, a little bit of pansies. Sorry, the camera is going in and out of focus with me moving. But it's just an impressionistic little setting. Now, I thought I was finished, okay, and then I looked at my little bird and he looked so lonely, although he's cute up in the sky, and I thought, well, as Bob Ross used to say with the trees, everybody needs a little friend. So I hope you agree, I'm going to take that sky and get some more birds to fly into it. And all the birds are done in the shape of a letter of the alphabet, so this will be a V. <laughs> Sometimes I do M's and sometimes I do W's. Pressure on towards the body. In fact, um, I would start from the inside out most of the time. Little body underneath is pretty easy. It's like a comma stroke and a little beak at the end. And basically they're all the same. This is what they look like. There's your M, your W and your V's. And with four and a little bluebird, there's five. Well, we got to the stage where we are finished. You can sign your name. I would love to see your final results. So feel free to email me or Facebook me with your own project. Thank you for joining me one more time. And thank you for being supportive of the Acrylic Painting Club on school online school <laughs> and my grateful thanks always go to um, Rosemary and uh, Nilda for being my partners in painting crime thank you and see you soon bye bye